if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to the book of Philippians chapter 1. I believe God has given me a really uh, great word for your life this morning. Let me put my timer on so that I don't go over. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. And just keep it there, and in a few moments, we are going to begin reading. So as I spent some time in prayer and meditation over this upcoming year for this church, I felt in my heart that there are some things that need to be shifted in some of the things that we do as a church. Because if, if a church isn't careful, it falls into a spirit of routine and just does things just because we've always done them that way. Um, and so... I, this year, I just felt like God wanted to shake some things up. Hebrews 12 talks about uh, from time to time, God will shake things in our lives so that which can't be shaken remains, and all the other fluff in our lives goes away. Um, and I really feel that God wants to do that in our lives this year and as a church. So normally in January, we would spend three days or three nights a week here praying, uh, and we do a corporate 21-day fast. But this year, I just felt to do something different. So... Uh, we're not going to do a 21-day fast. A few of us leaders will fast on Wednesdays, and we, if you'd like to fast with us, feel free to. That's something between you and Jesus, and we're not going to ask you to uh, publicize that. Um, but every Wednesday, uh, we're going to still have our, our, the youth church and our kids uh, program. But adults, we're going to gather, and we're, just, we're, going to, we're going to learn a little bit about prayer every Wednesday. And then we are going to just put boots on the ground, and we're going to pray. Because there are going to be things in your life that can only be unlocked as you pray. So please don't complain about the situation that you're in if you aren't spending time praying about it. Because listen to me. Listen. Nobody can pray for your kids better than you. Do you got that? A lot of times we want others to pray for our family, for our marriage, and our kids. But I don't love your kids the way you love them. I'm not saying I don't love them. I just don't love them the way that you love them. Nobody can love my daughter the way that my wife and I love her. God is the only one that outloves her. And so if I really love Maddie, then I'm going to spend time praying for that little girl. And, and if there's an issue there, I've got to learn to stop relying on everyone else's prayers and get on my knees and fight for her life. And fight for my marriage and fight for my finances and fight for this house. And so I want to I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. It's going to be four weeks where Dr. Stewart is going to teach us a little bit about prayer. And if anyone knows how to teach prayer, it's that man of God. And, and then we are just going to spend time praying together, okay? So, so join us. And then for those of you that lead small groups, we're going to speak with you in a bit. And we're going to ask you to, to give 10 minutes of your small group time to a prayer target that we'll assign and I believe that there's going to be breakthrough. And I believe there's going to be victory. Are you, are, you, are you with me a little bit? All right? And then on social media, we'll put out some targets. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, whatever else we're on. Um, and then on the 26th, uh, the last Saturday of this month, we are going to do 24 hours of prayer in the chapel where we'll ask you to sign up. And for 24 straight hours, we're going to have people here praying for this upcoming year. What if this is the year? And only you know what, what you're asking for. But what if, what if this was the year? that it happened, and it was unlocked in the month of January. I'm just trying to get you a little bit excited. I, I, I just think God wants to shake some things up. So, so I, yesterday I ran across the scripture, and it really blessed me. It's Hebrews 10, 36, because I think this scripture really uh, is something that we as, as Christians need. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says this, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For you have need of endurance. Now, that Greek word endurance is the word hupomone. And hupomone is simply this, the ability to stand strong under immense pressure. So Paul says what you need is hupomone. You need endurance. You need to be able to stand strong under immense pressure. It is that ability. It's, it's not drawing back. It's not giving in. It's truly, in, in all reality, it's staying power. It's when you are going through that difficult situation in your life, when you are struggling with a rebellious kid, when you are struggling in a broken marriage, when you are struggling at work and everything within you tells you to run, you stay. 
There's not too many people that have hupomone today. There's not too many that can stand strong when life is contrary. And it's the ability not only to stand strong, but to also have a great attitude while you're going through it. Attitude. Right? Because you can say, oh, I'm standing strong, but I hate the world right now. And I will cut anybody. Okay, if... We're going to be also real in 2019, okay? For those of you hypocrites, we don't want that here. We want real so that we can get healed. I tweet that, amen? All right. So there are far too many of us that run and quit when life is contrary, and we don't know really how to endure hardship. And so if you'll allow me to the next 25, 29 minutes and 25 seconds, I want to show you what hupomone looks like. So that as the Apostle Paul said, we can be. In Ephesians 6.13, he wrote this. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. And I love that. He says, so that after you have done everything, after you've prayed, after you've cried, after you've cussed, after you've been angry, after you're mad at the entire world, after you've done everything possible, you're still standing. I know I said cussed, but I know some of you are cussers here. So after you're done with your little pity party and temper tantrum, you stand. See, everybody gets nervous when we talk real life. Come on. It's, it's after you've done everything and thrown your little fit, you're standing. Because the day of evil is coming to you. What does that mean? Like, oh, my God, I'm scared. No. It just means hard times come. I think you've been alive long enough to understand that. And he says, after you've done everything, you're standing. So if 2018 was that difficult year for you, then in 2019, you have to flip the script. And that's the series that I want to bring to you the next few Sundays. It's called Flip the Script, and I love that phrase. I, I, wanna, I, I looked up some definitions of Flip the Script, and it's basically this. It's to reverse a situation, especially by doing something unexpected. It's take what someone said or did against you and use it to your advantage. It's to gain control in a situation where you had previously been dominated. It's really to deviate from the norm and to turn the tide. I love that. Flip the Script. I, th- I love these definitions because when you flip the script in your life, you choose to let go of a victim mentality and you choose to think differently. Because listen, once you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit and once you receive knowledge of Scripture, you can no longer say that you are a victim. Because a victim doesn't know any better. But in this house, you're getting word. You're no longer a victim. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, so it's time to flip the script on that victim mentality that it's everybody else's fault except yours. You flip that script, and I love that. It's an, it's an attitude where you say that storm that was sent to destroy me actually becomes the source of my strength. Are you with me? So I, I saw this on Instagram, and, and, and I really love this image. The devil whispers, you can't withstand the storm. The warrior replied, I am the storm. Yeah. Right? Now, my version is this next one. The devil whispers, you're not strong enough. I answered back, you're. Okay, for those of you who are grammatically challenged, take a moment and look at it. Take a moment and look at it. Some of you still don't get it. Whisper to your neighbor and tell him what's wrong with this. Really, some of you still don't get it because you should be laughing by now or, th- or you're really offended. <laughs> but those of you that text, you guys know how. Yeah, you know that Christian comedian, John Christ? Right, he put something like that and I corrected him and put your. <laughs> okay. So when the deaf fool whispers, Mike, you're not strong enough, and he spells it like that, I answered back, you're an idiot, it's your. (laughs) And so you need to understand that you flip the script. Somebody got it finally, all right? (laughs) Somebody got it finally. You're slow, but you're worth waiting for, all right? You flip the script. 
And it's time to turn the tide in your life. It's time to say, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. It's time to say, I can do all things through Christ. It's time to say, I am no longer the bottom. I am on top. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. It's time to change the story. It's time to change the narrative in your life where you say, I am the storm. I gain strength from this. And let me show you through scripture. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit. Let, let me share with you the scripture that I'm talking about. There in Philippians chapter 1. I don't have time to open the Bible there. It'll be up on the screen. Philippians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul writes and he says this. He says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance or the advance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So here we have the Apostle Paul, and, and he's in a Roman prison, and he's facing death. And he was put in prison be, just because he was preaching Jesus, and they didn't like it. And so they sent him to Rome, and now he's in this Roman jail, awaiting trial, not sure if he's going to live or die. Chapter 1 is just an amazing story. But, but he receives this letter from this church of the Philippians. Now, now the church at Philippi was his favorite church. It was one of the first churches that he founded uh, with another lady named Lydia, who was a seller of purple. And, and uh, God did some amazing things. He's there in jail, actually, years before. And, and he's been beaten down with a man named Silas. And they're in prison. They're, they're just beat down. And they're bruised. And they're broken. And their lips are bleeding. And the Bible says that at midnight, they began to sing songs of joy. And, and the Bible says that as they began to worship and sing, God, sing songs of joy in the midst of their chains and in the midst of their trial, as they worshiped that an earthquake shook the jail cell, the doors opened and they left free. It was that church, that place, that they write to him and they're worried about him and they said, Apostle, what can we do? What's, what's wrong? What, what, what's happening to you? And he's in this prison, and, and not only was that bad enough, but other preachers who hated him, because it's unfortunate that you will have rivalries between churches and between pastors that is so stupid, it's just ungodly, but others began to speak evil of Paul and say, oh, you're the apostle, but you're in prison. You must be in sin. There must be secret sin. God is punishing you because you are in jail. You've done something wrong. And so all of a sudden, they start taking the platform and preaching, saying, don't listen to Paul anymore. He's in prison. Begin to listen to us and give us your money instead of giving it to the kingdom. And all this is going on in his life. And he could have become angry. And he could have been upset with God. God, why do you have me here? I'm doing your will. Why am I in prison? Why am I going through this, this time of, of loneliness? Why am I here? And he could have become bitter with God. And he could have become discouraged. And, and he could have wanted to die due to the loneliness. But I want you to watch how he flips the script. How he answers this church. He says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel and the kingdom. I want you to understand that I sit here at chained, but I'm not chained. I want you to understand that I am not a victim to these circumstances. The devil sent me here, but God is using me here. And he says, now everyone in the praetorium, everyone in the imperial guard, and many in Rome have heard about my storm, and many are coming to know Jesus because I'm here. And if I wasn't here in this storm, if I wasn't here locked up, then many people wouldn't know Jesus. I, I want you to try to grasp. Junior, would you come up here and, and let's, let's share a little bit about, about what I did this morning. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul, the, the, really the father of the New Testament church, the Apostle Paul, he's chained to a Roman soldier. Now look at this Roman soldier for a second. Pat, 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 pat. And he's single and ready to mingle. We are taking applications at $100 an app. <laughs> and, and, and Roman soldiers were ungodly. They were mean people. Many were barbarians. And they were huge. And can you imagine? Think, think, think gladiator. And here's Maximus Decimus Meridius. 
So, I'm serious. He's single, okay? And, and here's Maximus. He has many gods that he worships. Burns incense to Caesar. Very ungodly. And he's chained to the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine what he's going through being chained to our great apostle? He's got no chance. 12 hour shifts, 6 a.m., waking up. Apostle Paul is, um, since we're chained, I pray. We're chained. Oh, but you're going to listen. And here's the Apostle Paul beginning to pray his morning prayers. And this guy could be angry and he could be upset. He can even be cussing and that doesn't move Paul. Because Paul understands that whoever he is tied to is going to receive a blessing. Ooh, you need to understand that. You receive and give whoever you're tied to. I'll, I'll wait for another point to make that point deeper. And, and, here, and here's this Roman soldier. He's got no chance. The Apostle Paul's praying, spending time in God's presence. The power of God fills that jail cell. And because they're connected, he's beginning to feel what Paul's feeling. And all of a sudden, this guy wants to know a little bit more about Paul and wants to know a little bit more about faith. And he finishes his 12-hour shift, and he goes back. And guess what? He's going to go tell his family. And here comes the next soldier. Now, this one's a little bit bigger. <laughs> and by bigger, I mean stronger. Stop. And he's got the night shift. And now he's got to put up with Paul's snoring, but he's got to put up with Paul's intercession. And they're tied. And, and, and he's ungodly. He burns incense to Caesar, but he's next to the greatest soldier in the Christian faith, the Apostle Paul. And he's hearing Paul as Paul is writing to the Philippians, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually served for the furtherance and the advance of the kingdom of God. I'm not a victim. I'm here on purpose. I'm taking away the power of the devil that put me here and I'm giving glory to God so that I strip the devil of his power and I give God his power. Do you understand that? And as they're tied together and he's hearing everything, you don't think he's feeling, like are you feeling the power of God right now? Because I'm really feeling the power of God right now. And all of a sudden he goes home and he tells his, his Hawaiian wife what God has done. And so it's day after day, week after week that this is happening. So Paul writes to them and says, I want you to understand that all the Praetorian Guard knows Jesus now. I want you to understand that Maximus gave his heart to Jesus and is no longer a gladiator. I, I need you to understand. I need you to understand that what has happened to me has served for the gospel to go forward. And not only for me, but other Christians now in the area have become more bold because of my chains. And so now the gospel all over Rome is going out and it's advancing the kingdom. And he writes to the church at Philippi and he writes to Sendero Life Center today saying, I am the storm. I am flipping the script. I am not a victim. I may be going through this hell. I may have been going through a hard time, but I'm not a victim of it. I won't allow these circumstances to get inside of me. And so he thought, the devil brought me here to kill me, but God brought me here to free people. And just like Paul, you have to change the narrative of your life. You don't have to accept the sickness that has hit your body. You don't have to accept that confusing spirit or that insecurity or discouragement or depression or anger or jealousy. Whatever it is that you're going through, you can flip the script on it. But it starts in your heart and soul. It starts right here, family. It starts right here and right here. You, you've, this is where you change things. And it starts with this attitude, plain and simple. I need to change. Today, we don't want to be transparent. Today, we're so prideful that we don't want to admit that we're kind of messed up. 
But we have to have that attitude, I want to change. I, I, I want to change. I, I don't want to live like this anymore. Aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? I want to change, and I want to defeat this. Man, if you, if you get that in your soul, if you get that in your spirit, you become dangerous. You see, listen, listen to this truth. There's going to be some things in your life that God will free you once and for all. There's things that you might, have, you might have before God that you want to overcome and you come to an altar or someone prays for you and God just miraculously frees you. And, and, and there's stories of that all the time and it's praise the Lord for that. But there are some things in your life that God won't deliver you from that you've got to confront every morning. Every morning you've got to say, I'm not going to light up that cigarette. I'm stressed. I don't know how to handle this, and I want to smoke so bad, but I'm not going to do it. I want to drink this bottle so bad right now, but I'm not going to do it. Man, that, 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 I want to go to that website. God, why don't, why don't you free me from this? And you have to make a conscious decision to say no to that. I'm attracted to the same sex. All right, now it's coming. I'm attracted to the same sex, but I know it's not right. And so every morning I have to say, even though I'm attracted to the same sex, it doesn't mean I'm gay. I can defeat this every morning. Yes, I said it. Because I don't need your approval, I need God's approval. And I'd rather speak truth with grace than to lie to you. I can say no to these things, and there's going to be times where it's very difficult. But that's where hupomone comes in. That when everything within you is screaming to just give in to that temptation, where you say, no, I'm going to endure this. I, I hope somebody's getting this this morning. Where you flip the script on this. And for the next just 12 minutes, I, I just want to give you a couple more things, and then, and then we're going to be done this morning. I, I want to give you a little bit of my, my testimony, things that I've learned in my 44 years of, of life. I know I look like I'm 21, but I'm not. Okay? I've learned this. I've learned that my life is not my own. I don't belong to Misael Alvarado Jr. By the way, that's my real name. I don't belong to Mike. I don't belong to Mikey. I, I don't belong to myself. I've had to learn that. That the decisions I make can't be based solely on what makes me feel good. My life is not my own. It, it belongs to Jesus. And he has a master plan. And family, that master plan includes mountaintop victories, but it also includes valleys, storms, and defeat. Yep. God's master plan includes valleys, storms, and defeat. Why? Because if you'll be honest with yourself, and I'll be honest with myself, I learn more about me in defeat than I do in victory. Because we can all say hallelujah when all is well. We can all show up to church when everything is good. But why is it when we go through hell, we stop going to church and stop reading scripture and stop doing what we need to do to get better? Why? Why do we run away instead of running to? I learn more about who I am in defeat than I do in victory. Because when I'm going through hell and I'm depressed and I'm discouraged, I learn more about the real me in that moment than I do when the church is full and we're, and we're saving souls and I, everything's great. I don't learn about me during those seasons. I learn about me when I'm alone and I'm down. And will I rise? Or will I give in? You see, that's where you learn. And, and so what has helped me? 
There's a verse in scripture that God gave me when I was 10 years old. You see, there was a program um, back in, in, in the, still some assemblies of God churches called Royal Rangers. Royal Rangers, just like Boy Scouts, uh, but with the assemblies of God. And, and you would do certain things to get, get badges. And when I was 10, I think that's the pioneers when you're 10. And I had to memorize Psalms 23. And when I memorized Psalms 23, verse 4 is the verse that just really hit me at the age of 10. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I don't know why as a 10-year-old, as a 10-year-old, I had no clue what that meant. I was just memorizing it because I wanted a badge. I had no idea that at the age of 10, God was setting me up for what I was going to go through in my adult years. You see how he has a master plan? And I had to learn when I was 10 some words, but God was preparing me so that those words would become part of my life. It's interesting, family, and you don't have to say amen to this, but it's interesting how everything and everyone around you can be blessed and great and happy while you're battling and suffering in silence. Got quiet. That was 2018 for me. 2018 was the greatest year in the history of Sendero. In our growth, there was more souls saved ever in 2018. The church has grown. Just look around. In every area of the ministry of, of this church, it has grown. We are probably the fastest growing church in our region right now. And I'm not saying that to boast, okay? Yet, 2018 was probably one of the top two most dark years of my life. Dark. Dark. You see, when I say there are some things that God will deliver you from instantly and others that he won't, God hasn't delivered me from depression. It's something that I face most days. And every morning I have to choose Jesus. Every moment I have to choose scripture over my feelings. Because I've come to understand and I've disciplined myself that feelings aren't reliable. That feelings depend on circumstance. But who I am depends on the word of God. And so every day I have to remind myself, what does scripture say about Mike? What does scripture say about my life? Not what my feelings say. Not what my bank account says. Not what Sendero says. Not what the, the shape of my marriage says. What does scripture say about my life? What does scripture say about you? And so this life verse, go back, go back has meant a lot to me, and let me break it down in one minute for you, how it's blessed me. I've understood a couple things. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. A couple things that we need to understand about that. Notice that the author says, even though I walk through it, I'm walking, I'm moving, I'm not sitting in it. I'm not stuck in it. I'm moving through it. Every day I'm moving. I'm getting up. I'm taking a shower. I'm putting clothes on. I'm putting cologne on. Every day I'm moving forward. I'm spending time in scripture. He says, even though I walk through it, I'm walking. Some of you, you choose when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you choose to stay. And there comes the victim mentality. And you have to flip the script on that. He says, I walk through it. The second thing I notice about that he says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not death. It's only the shadow of death. That means shadows are just meant to paralyze you with fear. It's not the real thing. It's just the shadow. Hmm. Four weeks ago, I was sitting in my living room, and out of nowhere, I thought I was going to die. My heart started racing, and I'm sitting there. And I start tearing up. And I said, God, I don't want to die. I'm not ready for that yet. Yes, to go and be with you is way better than this crummy earth. But I'm not ready yet, God. 
my wife and my daughter aren't ready for me to be gone. Sendero can always have another pastor, but they can't have another me. I'm not ready for that. And I thought, family, for about 15 minutes, I literally thought I was going to die, that God was going to take my life. And all of a sudden, this came up. Why? Because when you have scripture in you, in your darkest moments, the scripture comes to, out of you. And you remember what scripture says. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Hijito, son, this is just the shadow of death. I'm trying to paralyze you in fear. And there's some of you that you thought that you were going to die. You thought it was over. You thought cancer was going to take you. And the Lord says to you this morning, it's just the shadow, baby. It's just the shadow. It's not the real thing. Don't be paralyzed by that fear any longer. It's just the shadow. And then he says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I come to learn that Jesus is my shepherd and he's got, he's got his weapons out to defend me. So as I'm walking, he's walking with me. And family, that's how I've learned to have hupomone. So that when I'm struggling, I can sit and say, God, what's going on? What is it that's happening around me or in me that you want my attention for? So, and I also remember Philippians 1, 6, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, what I love about that is that God isn't a man that starts something and doesn't finish it. Come on, guys. Come on. Some of us, we have that project that we started in 2018, and it's there still. I know the, li the wives don't want to say amen to that, but... You see, God never starts something that he hasn't already finished. God, you got you to gotta get that. He doesn't start something that he hasn't finished. Your life is finished. You just haven't caught up to it yet. God has done what you've asked him already. You just haven't caught up to it yet. It's on the way so that he that began a good work is finishing it every day. He'll bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, until you get to heaven. So it's done already. You just got to catch up. You got to understand that if it's going through it, somehow it's part of the story. David said it like this in Psalms 139. He said, uh, go to the next one. He said, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David writes there, he says, while I was in my mama's belly, as a small baby, as a small little bean. You know moms, when you're pregnant and you have that little flutter, David's talking about that as a flutter. He says, your eyes saw my unformed body substance and all the days of my life were written for me before I was even born and so if 2018 was that year for you where you battled it's time to flip the script it's time to take you see you need to is is through that dark season that I went through in 2018 you didn't see it from this pulpit and it wasn't that I lived a lie. I grew closer to Jesus. I spent more time in prayer. My ability to hear his voice was sharpened. My ability to speak truth in people's lives was sharpened. I became a better husband. I became a better father. I became a better friend. It was sharpened. And so I flipped the script on him. I said, you can bring depression into my life. You can bring discouragement into my life. I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. I will serve him in good and in bad and in ugly. I will serve Jesus. And nothing can stop me from doing that. Nothing can separate me from that love. Family, that is the attitude that we need to have. That is hupomone. That is standing strong under immense pressure. It's staying power. It's not about feelings. Feelings lie to us. Your feelings should serve you. It shouldn't be the other way around. 
Well, I just don't feel like I love her anymore, so I should divorce her. That's a feeling. Hupomone. Stick it out. Get closer to Jesus. Let him have the say. And I believe that the 2019 is that year where we have to flip the script. And just like Paul said, I'm going to take what the devil meant to ruin my life and I'm going to use it to ruin his. My pastor Tommy Barnett said it this way, hit the devil with his own stick. Take it out of his hand and hit him with it. And how do you do that? Whatever you're struggling with, you use it to glorify God. 